Hi, welcome to our talk on one of the key skills of being a masterful advocate. And that skill I want to talk to you about is that of having courage. And I think to be an effective advocate, you need to really develop and foster your courage. So the first thing I want to say is what do I mean by, by courage? I think I mean doing the right thing at the right time, regardless of how we're feeling at that particular day. It involves, without a doubt, confronting any pain that we've got or confronting fear that's going to stop us and debilitate us in that moment of doing what we should be doing. So most advocates think that they're very skillful at putting the client first and in representing the client. And I would agree that most advocates do that very, very well. The truth is, though, that we only do it very, very well when we're in a comfortable zone when we're not fearful, when we feel safe. So as an advocate, I might challenge when I'm feeling confident, when I know what I need to say, or I know I'm likely to get a good outcome. It's more difficult to do that when we have feelings of fear. And I want to talk to you about being really honest with yourself, about identifying those triggers and those situations where you feel fearful. So I want to talk to you about a time in my professional experience where I felt quite debilitated by fear. And it was a few years ago, but I was working with a, a young person in a review meeting. Now, we had the referral quite late, so I only had a chance to meet this young person once. Didn't have a massively strong relationship with her, but we, we, we decided on what we were going to say in, in the review. And that, that was okay. The planning stages were fine. So I get to the review and there's about 15 people in the room, which as you know as an advocate isn't uncommon, but it can be really qu quite intimidating for the client and the advocate. People are suited and booted, professional, people use professional titles. And the meeting started and it was very, very formal and very intimidating for, for, for the young person. And when I say intimidating, it was intimidating because a lot of the professionals started to look at what was going wrong for, for, for the client. They, they started talking about the problems and, and things that the client had gotten wrong and mistakes that they'd made. And it created this air, which in real time, I didn't know what was happening, but in real time, it, it became very uncomfortable. And then before I know it, there's, there's a psychiatrist in the room and, and she starts talking about post-traumatic stress disorder she starts talking about the incident. And without actually saying the words, I become aware that it's likely that this young person has suffered quite serious either abuse or, or an attack or, or some, something that's been very traumatic. Now, the psychiatrist hadn't said anything. She hadn't breached confidentiality. But the way this person's information had been shared and discussed in a really trivial and carefree way made it very, very uncomfortable. And as the advocate, I'm sitting there thinking, this isn't right, that this, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't feel very respectful, but do I say anything? Because is it my role to say anything? I'm, and it's happening in real time, so it's difficult. Anyway, the next minute, the young person gets very upset, speaks dreadfully to a social worker, swears, calls her very vile names, and leaves the room. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, what did you expect, really? But then two things happened that, that shocked me and have really impacted on my practice. And the first thing that shocked me was that nobody got up to go after that young person. Now, I, I'd only met, met her once, so I didn't know her that well. But nobody got up, no key worker, no social worker, the parents were there, nobody got up to go after her, and I thought, that's, that's sad. And then the second thing that made me very angry was that the social worker got very upset and said, do you see what I have to put up with? And she started to get quite teary because of the way she'd been spoken to. And then the meeting comforted the social worker. And it made me very angry because I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? You've got a young person outside who's become very upset because of the way the adults had essentially behaved. And the social worker, who's an adult, who has got lots of opportunities to get support, is seeking the, the, the support of her colleagues. And it felt wrong. Now, I've, I did go out after the young person. We had a chat and when we came back. But what's interesting about their experience is, is I didn't say anything. And I should have. I should have at that point in the meeting said, there's something wrong with this picture. That your young person that you're all here for, not the other way around, but you're here for this young person's outside very distressed. 
and you're all worried about the impact on you. And that's wrong. Now, at the time, I rationalised this by saying, well, it's not my role to say anything. And I also rationalised it by saying that the client hadn't instructed me to say anything. And I'm, I'm sure you might, might do that as well. The client hasn't said for me to say anything, so I'm not going to say anything. And the third thing that went through my mind is, is actually, it's not that bad. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm imagining this. I'm overreacting. And that was how I rationalised and justified just staying quiet. But it bothered me for days and days and days. And when I spoke to my mentor about it, she called me on it and she said, you were afraid. And, and I didn't like that at the time, but, but she was right. And the truth is I was afraid because I wanted to be liked in that meeting. It was one of my first experiences of advocating in a meeting and I didn't want to get it wrong. I was also fearful of becoming labelled as a troublemaker. So I didn't want to be the one to put up my hands and say, there's something wrong with this picture. Because there were 15 people in that room, why would it be me who has to say that? So I was fearful and that, that's where my nervousness come from and it completely paralysed me. So it taught me a lot. And this is what, what's interesting about that experience. I don't think I did bad advocacy. I didn't do anything wrong that day. I was a good advocate, but I certainly wasn't outstanding. And it's taught me now that, that I'm, I'm much more quick and comfortable to say there's something wrong with this picture. And I think in moments where we, we do experience fear, the skill of the outstanding advocate isn't to ignore that fear. It's not to simply close your eyes and wish it away. That's not what courage is. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage won't eliminate those feelings and the nervousness. But what it will do is it will give me enough energy to be the one to put my hand up and say, there's something wrong. I need to say something here. I need to ask a question. So my, my will for you is to think about how do you use courage in your work? What are the moments where you feel fear and how can you overcome them?